Our next speaker is uh, virtual. Uh, so we're going to just key that up here. Uh, it's Dr. Patrick Brown. Uh, Dr. Patrick Brown is a distinguished pre professor of plant nutrition at the University of California, Davis in the USA. Uh, received his Bachelor of Science in 1984 uh, uh, from Adelaide uh, University in Australia, PhD from Cornell University in 1988. Uh, Dr. Brown has authored more than 260 scientific journal articles and numerous books with contributions uh, to basic and applied plant, bi plant biology, ag policy development, and ag extension. Uh, we'll, we'll go on from there, but uh, numerous awards and uh, in excellence of research and ag extension. And today, uh, Dr. Brown is joining us to talk about what is a plant nutrient, changing definitions to advance science and innovation in plant nutrition. Uh, welcome, Dr. Brown. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation, which uh, Tom Brusma, who was just mentioned a moment ago, uh, arranged. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than some of the more practical stuff that you've heard so far. I'm going to talk about some sort of big principles and some big changes that are occurring in the global nutrient and also biostimulant. We'll touch upon that a little bit uh, in the definitions and how we think about fertilizers. Now, I'm fully aware that this has a very US-centric context, uh, also a bit of a European Union-centric context. I know the, the systems of fertilizer regulations and definitions are a little bit different in Canada. Nevertheless, I hope you'll find this valuable and it's sort of an interesting rethink of how we manage fertilizers and think about it. Uh, there's a paper I published last year uh, with Professor Fang Zhi Zhao and Achim Doberman. Many of you may know Achim Doberman uh, that we will focus most of this talk around. All right, so the, the title here, what is a plant nutrient changing definitions uh, is based on some historical context. And in fact, some historical context that probably is incorrect in the way legislators and regulators interpreted plant nutrition. Uh, we'll talk about the meaning, a little bit of the history of the terms that are commonly used, my, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients, et cetera, essential elements. Talk a little bit about um, legal definitions um, and then why we need to rethink. And this is sort of a cut to the final summary slide uh, the basics for why we're involved here while we're thinking about this is there are many elements that function as plant nutrients that don't currently that can't currently be char characterized or categorized as plant nutrients and hence fertilizers. Part of the roles that we're looking at here for these other than the NPK and the and the 14 essential elements that you're aware of, is that a number of plant nutrients can function in plant stress resistance, whether you're talking abiotic stress or biotic stresses, and hence they contribute to productivity and nutrient use efficiency. I'll very briefly touch upon some of the goings on in biostimulants and biofertilizer regulations, because there's an overlap here, and also talk about where the International Fertilizer Association uh, the ISO organization in the European Union, uh, IPMC, where they are going with sort of global regulatory harmonization. All right, so I have to rewind a little bit. There's a little bit of a history lesson that I'll, I'll present. And again, this is in the context of US regulations and European regulations. In the US, all agricultural chemicals, everything applied in agriculture is regulated through the FIFRA program listed on the left. The equivalent program in the European Union is the plant production products. And, and these two regulatory frameworks tend to lead the development that occurs in the rest of the world. In the US, FIFRA regulates registration, distribution, sale of all pesticides. And then they define what is a pesticide? And with any, with certain exceptions, a pesticide, a pesticide is defined as any substance, mixture of substance used for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating pests. That's pretty clear. But also anything used for a plant regulatory effect, which then requires us to look at the definition of a plant regulator. And this is where it becomes a little bit tricky and non intuitive. A plant regulator is any substance which acts through physiology to accelerate, retard the rate of growth or the rate of maturation of a plant, okay? 
And when you think about that, it's easy to see how pesticides and herbicides, why they would be classified as this. But in reality, if you look at that definition, anything that influences the rate of growth of a plant would obviously include nutrients, compost, plant hormones, biosimilants, water. So everything is captured under that definition of plant regulator. And this is one of the, the great errors that has occurred in regulatory framework over the last 50 years. And you might wonder where and why that came about. And it can be traced back to this. It can be traced back to, among others, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in the, mid, in the early 60s, that pointed out that there was an overuse of pesticides and a, a dramatic lack of regulation in agricultural chemicals in general. Now, the great impetus was DDT and the effects it was causing on, on ecology throughout North America. Um, but it was also, to a certain extent, a sense amongst environmental activists that the ag chemical interest industries were not acting in the interests of either the general population or even the agricultural uh, commodity agricultural stakeholders. And I love this. This is a real advertisement from 1968, singing the song that DDT is good for me. We had also, uh, following on from Rachel Carson's book, uh, a couple of major environmental disasters occurring around the world. There was one in England, there was one in Italy. And that was the framework work by which this regulation was built. It was the context that most of the products that were being utilized and sold as uh, to be used in the environment, to be used in agriculture were pesticides and should be considered dangerous. So that's where this original framework came from. Um, also, of course, most of the plant hormones that were in use in the 60s and 70s were those that were being used as herbicides, as hormonal disruptors. They did establish exceptions. Uh, it was recognized early on that this generic classification of all things agrochemical as evil uh, wouldn't work, and some of the specific exceptions are listed here. So products that are intended to improve the plant, the growth of a plant will not get the plant regulator classification and hence pesticide classification. And in the US and the European Union, also in the Canadian structure, there are exemptions. So plant nutrients are an exemption. Uh, compost, gypsum, liming materials, nitrification inhibitors are some of the others. That exemption takes all those chemicals out of pesticide regulations, which have very stringent uh, human health, environmental persistence, minimum residue level requirements, and safety of use requirements. Now, in the US, the federal government doesn't actually define what is a plant nutrient, because we have here a statement that says plant nutrients are exempted. So what do we mean by the term plant nutrient, and who interprets and defines that? Now, in the US, a little bit like in Canada, uh, there are organizations that have acted on this definition and said, okay, well, what is the list of elements that we can classify and regulate and, and call plant nutrients? Uh, in the US, it's this lovely acronym, AFCO, American Association of Plant Food Control Organizations, who make this guidance that each of the states can choose to abide by. I'm going to cite some of these words because this is where it becomes particularly relevant to this discussion. The AFCO definition uses this word essential. Uh, it also includes a, what we call a positive list, that is a list of nutrients, elements, that AFCO has determined are essential for plants and hence can be called fertilizers. The implication is anything outside of this positive list is not a fertilizer, is not a nutrient, and hence is a pesticide. And this is where the inconsistencies in uh, US regulatory regulations and, and many of the global regulations has come about. By this sort of confluence of definitions, first at the EPA, then at the state level, you can make the statement only essential elements may be used in fertilizers. And elements and nutrients that are beneficial 
but not meeting the standard of essential, and I'll define those two in a moment, cannot be called plant nutrients or be utilized as fertilizers. And I'll give you some examples of where that is problematic. So we, all of you, I think, uh, in your undergraduate agronomy and science probably learned what the criteria of essentiality. It was established at UC uh, Berkeley in 1939. The most important statement here is that plants must be unable to complete their life cycle. So that's the defining feature. There's a list that exists in modern textbooks. Um, since 1987, almost all, well, all of the major textbooks recognize 14 nutrients as essential. Uh, in a couple of jurisdictions, nickel, which was actually my PhD, we, and we added this to the list of essentiality, and chlorine are not included. Uh, so there's a little bit of inconsistency, not in the textbooks and not in science, but only in the regulatory um, interpretation of this list. And if you look at all the major textbooks, and many of you will be familiar with these textbooks, this list of this criteria of essentiality is established. This list of elements that belong on it is established. However, uh, if you look in modern textbooks, and there's four of them noted here, the definition of what is a plant nutrient is broader than the regulatory definition. So the most recent definition of what is a plant nutrient, uh, in this case from the Marshner book, which is sort of the current uh, uh, most influential textbook in the realm, the mineral plant nutrient is an element which is either essential or beneficial. So in science, we have this recognition that the term essentiality, it's legitimate, but it is too narrow when thinking about the context of optimizing productivity, nutrient use efficiency, environmental efficiency, environmental sustainability of cropping systems. That's the contrast that we see with the existing regulatory framework. Uh, and as I said, I know the uh, Canadian um, structure is a little bit different than this. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these other elements and where and why and how they have a function in agriculture broadly and in plant, uh, plant life and plant biology more explicitly um, and talk about why it's important to think about this broadening of the definition of essentiality. So all of the textbooks have defined what the word beneficial means, it simply means it improves the performance, the growth, the development, productivity or quality of the final harvested product. Some of the elements that we know fall firmly into this realm, and the one you're probably most familiar with is silicon. Uh, another, sodium aluminum, I'll, I'll explain aluminum or aluminium, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say Australian English or North American English or selenium, are clearly essential in some species, but beneficial in many others. Iodine and selenium, I'll show you in a moment, have demonstrations of efficient of, of, of a function in disease resistance, stress resistance, um, and also in animal and human health as well. Now, this role in stress resistance becomes relevant because one of the major, of course, what is always or generally the determinant of whether you have a great year or a moderate year in a particular field is the amount of stress that was imposed. And so thinking about elements that can interact in that realm is an important consideration. And there are some truly strange ones that I will also show. There's evidence in very explicit circumstances where some of these elements may also be uh, considered plant nutrients. So I'm going to uh, borrow some slides here from a, a great professor, Professor Zhang Feng Ma in, in, China, in Japan uh, and Wendy Zellner in, uh, in the US, just to illustrate the concept whereby elements not considered essential in the classic plant physiology or regulatory definition are indeed essential in the productivity and the functional efficacy of how we manage our agriculture. And one of the best ways, one of the best demonstrations of this is the work that Professor Ma did 
in which he turned off the gene responsible for bringing silicon into the grain heads in rice. Wild type, non-transformed on the left, those with the silicon gene knocked out on the right, uh, LSI1 represents the knockout. And so you can see a difference in productivity. And in fact, if you look at total grain yield in this three or four year experiment here, you can see some very dramatic negative effects of the removal of the silicon transport gene on productivity. However, nobody is ever able to make 100% sterility and non-completion of the life cycle. So this is an example of where you don't quite meet the essentiality criteria, but you obviously meet the functionality criteria of an element, a nutrient that was required for meaningful productivity in these fields. And there's a whole host of interactions that we can think about with silicon, uh, thousands of papers that talk about specific functions. And one of the realities in modern agriculture, and perhaps why biostimulants have taken off, is the concept that the difference between a great year and an ordinary year or a great year and a poor year is the occurrence of plant stress. Some obvious, you know, frosted seeding, a drought in the middle of flowering, those are very obvious, but there's a host of intermediate small stresses that occur that if we could optimize and minimize their impact, we could improve productivity. And with improved productivity, always comes improved nutrient and water use efficiency and efficiency of use of all of your various inputs into your system. Silicon's particularly important for water use efficiency. This is the case in rice. The mechanism by which it influences water use efficiency is water transport from the root and evaporation from the leaf surface. Silicon, this is probably its most well understood function, acts as a protectant against fungal and bacterial leaf and foliar diseases. So it has a very discrete effect there, has an effect also on the architecture of the leaf and its ability to absorb sunlight. Iodine is an interesting new one. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's new in, in, in the fact that this paper is only uh, presented in 2021. But if you actually go back in history, the father of all plant nutrition, Professor Sprengel, did do some research in iodine and said it wasn't essential. Another prominent agronomist doing some work in, in the Netherlands at Wageningen said, oh, actually, it is essential and provided some of the proof for it. So differential iodine application, in this case, sugar beet, with a pr pronounced negative effect when he withdrew uh, iodine from the environment. And again, not an essential element. Nobody's ever been able to make a plant fail its completion of its life cycle. But clearly there's a commercial prerogative and a commercial effect that's highly relevant here. The most recent work, and this is done in the, in the, in the model plant we all use in biological research, a plant called Arabidopsis. Uh, it's a brassica, it's related to canola. And the effects of differential silicon supply are shown here. On the left, you have a deficiency four weeks after planting. On the right, sufficiency in two different levels. You can immediately see the difference in flowering status at that four-week stage, so a profound delay in flowering. Once you get towards the end of the entire growth cycle, these are very rapid-growing plants, complete their life cycle in about 10 weeks, uh, the, di the difference disappears. But what's relevant from an agronomic and productivity perspective is this 10-day, 7 to 10-day forward movement of flowering and narrowing of the intensity of flowering. So in a lot of cross-pollinated, out-pollinated crops, this ability to narrow the flowering window, control its occurrence, is, is very valuable in terms of productivity. I work mostly in things like almonds and tree crops uh, and con uh, short, highly synchronized flowering is a particularly important parameter. The mechanism of all of this is a little uncertain, but the biological action of iodine is quite clear. I put aluminum or aluminium in here to illustrate another important principle. Now, most of you, of course, recognize in low pH soils, a lot of our crops are uh, susceptible 
to aluminum toxicity, aluminum becoming more and more available as the pH of the soil declines. If you take a plant like tea, Camellia sinensis, its native habitat is low pH organic rich soils, pH soils in the 3.2 to 3.4 sort of level. At that concentration, at, at that soil pH, aluminum is abundant. And not surprisingly, camellia plants and plants adapted to acid soils have developed a beneficial role for aluminum in the plant. In this case, effective root growth. Uh, is a cent uh, aluminum is an essential component of the functionality. Now, we're not growing tea in, Deco in uh, Manitoba nor in California, but the point of this particular statement is that specific environments, specific plants can have specific, specific demand for nutrients, something that that list of essential elements doesn't embody. And of course, the other part of the equation is we don't grow plants strictly for the benefit of the animals that eat it. We grow plants and crops for the benefit they bring to humans. And it's not, of course, a surprise that essentially every nutrient and element that humans need are derived originally from plants. So human need for selenium and iodine, cobalt, uh, has absolutely been demonstrated. Those are known essential elements, the source of which are the agricultural crops being consumed directly by humans or by the animals that consume the crop, and then we consume the animal. Um, and as I mentioned, silicon has uh, clear roles in both uh, in plant growth and development, even sodium and others do. So where does this all leave us? Um, we do actually have regulatory frameworks that say nothing outside the list of 14 is essential and nothing outside the list of 14 elements can therefore be called fertilizers. That's in contrast to all of the science that says, oh, actually, we do know there's a host of elements with beneficial functions. There are others that on occasion show a positive effect. I'm going to have a little bit of a look at vanadium in a moment to give you that context as well. There's another context which all of us are now starting to think more and more about, and that is soil health. Because farming is not only about, you know, how can we get the most agronomic performance? Farming is about how can we build a soil profile, a soil uh, structure and health and microbiology that gives us optimal performance agronomically and gives us our plants maximum resilience. So as early as 1942, uh, Carlson working in Montana said, we ought to think about the microbes in the environment. We got to think about what do we need to manage the soil, to manage the microbes, to manage soil health, and hence agronomic productivity. One example of that, vanadium. There's a number of species for which vanadium is important. And most important amongst those are the soil nitrogen fixing uh, microbial populations, bacterial or fungal or bacterial or algal, uh, for which vanadium, not molybdenum, is the cofactor essential for functionality. There are a number of new uh, products on the market, that nitrogen supplementing microbes, et cetera, that many of you are familiar with, where there are unique requirements for some of these unusual elements not required by the plant required by the micro microbes themselves. Now, all of this, you might say, well, so what, how does that affect me in my day-to-day -day life? Um, I think what we've found is the current emphasis on the essentiality paradigm. That is, a nutrient is only a fertilizer if the plant will die without it. It's not consistent with maximal productivity. It's not consistent with optimizing our agronomic outcomes actually not even consistent with the with the originator's intent, neither with the textbooks. It compromises how we can think about research and innovation. If myself as a professor wanted to study iodine, I wouldn't be getting any funding from any federal or state agencies. Complicates our innovation practice, and it has an impact on our biostimulant biofertilizer regulations. I think if I'm correct, in Canada, silicon and selenium can be utilized not as fertilizers, but as beneficial substances or biostimulants. 
the biostimulant framework, however, says you can't be called a biostimulant if your product contains nutrients. So there's a conflict there. If we admit silicon is a nutrient, then it can't be a biostimulant. If we don't accept silicon as a nutrient, it can't be used as a fertilizer. And so we've got ourselves in this sort of circle, circularity of, of an issue here. So ultimately where this all ends up, uh, we wrote in that paper I showed you initially a new definition. And it, it, the emphasis, the most important part is a plant nutrient can still be essential in the classic formulation, but a nut plant nutrient can also be any element that's beneficial that does good for the agronomic uh, efficiency or agronomic productivity. To my great surprise, because everybody said there's no, no way on earth, Brown, that you could get this, nine, this 2022 definition into any sort of regulatory framework within the next 22 decades. Actually, we managed to alter the International Standards Organization, which, which writes the rules for most of Europe and a lot of the world, to adopt this new definition. Uh, at the International Plant Nutrition Council meeting in Brazil last year, which is sort of the academic meeting for plant nutritionists, it was adopted. In the US, the new definition has been uh, put, has been adopted. It needs to be ratified. It's due to be ratified in February, but all indications are that it will be accepted. So I tell my daughter this, though she doesn't believe it, that we've basically changed the rules of the world. But it's not complete. You know, many many uh, jurisdictions, many countries where we still have this conflict in definition, uh, which I think warrants some consideration. Uh, and, and I know Tom asked me to give this presentation here because it's relevant for what Canada is thinking about, not just for fertilizers, but for biostimulant regulations. We offer some fairly simple language for folks to think about. This is the way we change the definition in the US organization that makes these definitions. Simply changing from a definition that says it must contain a plant nutrient to define that a plant nutrient can both be essential or beneficial. Um, we maybe don't need to get into these details. We have a framework established. A moment ago, the International Fertilizer Association was mentioned. Uh, the International Plant Nutrition Council, which is sort of the academic, uh, are collaborating and providing various regulatory uh, organizations the language that could be uh, adopted in their particular circumstance. But also, uh, you know, there's a need here, of course, to have somebody defining what are the elements that may be verified as beneficial for a particular use, a particular crop, a particular environment? Because otherwise we open ourselves up for a commercial free-for-all where everybody's trying to sell everything. So we've established a framework which we hope can serve the purpose of gatekeepers in this regard. I'm just going to very finish quickly finish. Um, you know, you don't probably don't know who this guy is. Uh, he's the professor I took over from at Davis. Uh, he had as a mission when he first came across me in the department and I took over his job and he continued working at Davis. He retired from Davis at the age of 103. He turned up for his office all the time, done a huge number of things. He really is the grandfather, the father of plant nutrition. He championed the idea that silicon had so many beneficial roles in plant biology that it really should be amongst the elements allowed to be used in agriculture. And this broader context that the essentiality paradigm was incorrect and it wasn't really serving the needs of agriculture, nor was it consistent with scientific uh, parameters. Interestingly, uh, he did his PhD with the people who made the first definition, definition back in the 30s and the 40s. And with that, I thank you very much. A landscape shot here of California. My question kind of relates to how you were talking about the human health aspect. In the presentation before us, or before you, sorry, we were talking about how the new varieties actually are removing less nutrients in general uh, with the macros. Should we be concerned about that 
on a human health aspect because and also on a policy aspect because I know there's a large movement looking into uh, putting monetizing uh, values to how nutrient dense food is. Yeah, yeah. Now that's a fantastic question. And yeah, indeed, certainly for the micronutrients is a very clear negative effect of some of some of our modern cultivars on the density of the nutrient in the grain itself. Uh, zinc, iron, iodine, uh, it, certain crops, vitamin A, all have been depleted. Uh, the cause of that is, is multifold. One of them is that a lot of the breeding for new cultivars occurred logically in fields that were fantastic. And if you breed a crop over and over in a circumstance where it does not need to be very cautious about how it gets zinc from the soil, it will become weaker and poorer at getting zinc from the soil, which has that dual effect, diminishing the zinc concentration on the grain, but also putting a prerogative on growers to keep an eye on their zinc and their and their iron and their vital and, and their fertilization strategies. That's one part. The second part is you know, climate change, increasing CO2 in the environment, doesn't matter who caused it or what the cause was, also tends to diminish protein content and nitrogen content in grains. So you have that dual dynamic. So you're absolutely right. Uh, we have to pay attention to the dilution of food value that has occurred. Uh, and the monetization that you talk about is one approach to incentivize that change. 